We are happy to have Anna today. This is a short description of her talk. Uh, there has been a growing interest in machine learning application within medicine, but few studies have progressed to deployment in patient care. In this talk, we'll hear about successful deployment of ML in clinical practice, among other interesting things. Dr. Gallenberg is a senior scientist in genetics and genome biology program at SickKids Research Institute recently appointed as the first Varma family chair in biomedical informatics and artificial intelligence. She's also an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at University of Toronto, faculty member and an associate research director health at Vector Institute, and a fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, Child and Brain Development Group. Dr. Goldenberg trained in machine learning at Carnegie Mellon University with a postdoctoral focus in computational biology and medicine. The current focus on her lab is on developing machine learning methods that capture heterogeneity and identify diseases, disease mechanism in complex human diseases, as well as developing risk prediction and early warning clinical systems. She's a recipient of the Early Researcher Award from the Ministry of Research and Innovation and the Canada Research Chair in Computational Medicine. So let's invite Dr. Goldenberg. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is my pleasure to give this, uh, this talk. I hope I will tell you something new and interesting today. Um, my background is in machine learning, and the first neural net that I applied was in 99, so last century. And, um, but uh, uh, I switched to the field of uh, uh, healthcare in um, 2008 when I started kind of my, my postdoctoral uh, um, position. And I realized that there are so many questions, so many exciting problems that can only be solved by Kind of complex algorithms that uh, I stayed in this field and I find it very, very exciting. So um, I never give a talk anymore without actually defining what I'm talking about. Um, and to this audience, it may be very trivial, but it turns out that media has really corrupted the minds of a lot of people by um, by saying that AI is coming to get you or presenting that AI is robots. And of course, to all of us who at CMU, there is a robotics institute. And then there is the rest of AI, which is much bigger than the robotics institute. And so every movie that came out that represented AI as robotics, we were like, come on, there's so much more to it. So uh, artificial intelligence, um, as people have come to represent it in the media, as in this somehow supernatural intelligence that generalizes also well beyond what it was programmed to do doesn't exist, right? We all know that, yes? Um, it doesn't exist. Uh, what exists is really specialized uh, kind of problem solvers, algorithms that we define. Um, a lot of them are probabilistic algorithms that we define that actually are able to solve specific problems with uh, a capacity that's certainly beyond uh, human. So um, facilitating that, uh, a lot of that is machine learning, which is kind of a sub subfield of AI. Uh, AI is bigger than that, but uh, machine learning is kind of the workhorse uh, has been um, recently uh, beyond a lot of the successes in um, that, that we see, the AlphaGo, et cetera. And of course, there's deep learning, and it's also extremely hot and very trendy and the reality is that people should apply it with care. I think I've seen uh, our favorite conference, NeurIPS, grow from 300 to 7,000 because it's easy to use deep learning, but you really have to be thoughtful about how you use it to, uh, especially in applications to real data. So it's just the, one of the types of the methods, uh, encoding nonlinearity in the data. So actually, um, we started, we did a, a bit of a survey. Um, of course, I did it through my Facebook, so it's extremely biased to people who know a, AI and machine learning. But uh, um, what uh, I, I will tell you, so we asked uh, multiple questions, but one of them was when people think machine learning will be adapted and uh, adopted in uh, clinical care. And, um, well, 
can you switch it back to the presentation mode? That was supposed to be the pointer. Okay, no pointer, fine. Um, so uh, the way to read this kind of, not necessarily pretty, but informative graph is uh, that a majority of the people who are expert or consider themselves pretty good at it. So this is a, again, a biased assessment, but um, within the next five to 10 years, people think that it will mostly be adopted. People who heard of it or um, um, heard of it are more skeptical about its adoption, but we think that it will be adopted. Maybe not so broadly, but uh, it will definitely uh, be present uh, across clinical care. I find it quite, quite interestingly that when we ask when will AI be integrated into clinical care? So first we asked whether people think that AI exists. <coughs> A lot of people said no. So of course, uh, then there was this question. It's a little bit of priming. I think it's fun. So uh, if you look at the expert uh, bars here, so the, the bottom uh, bars, the experts really, really think that AI and generalizable AI, the one that will learn and train from the data beyond uh, the specific problem solving is, is 20 years and more out. Um, so this is, this is uh, I think it is a fun exercise, but um, getting more serious, why uh, is uh, machine learning going to be helpful in clinical care and for what kind of problems will it be helpful? So um, here's a story. I work with a lot of clinicians, a lot of clinicians with different expertise. And this is a story from the critical care team, which I work with uh, very closely. So uh, a healthy 12 year old boy uh, was skiing and um, fell and broke his leg. Um, so with a femur fracture, he was actually helicoptered over to see kids um, to do the surgery. And they did the surgery and the surgery was successful, but he, um, he formed a clot um, post-surgery. And this clot traveled from the leg to the heart and he had a cardiac arrest. So um, what happened was that um, the problem with the cardiac arrest is that it almost inevitably leads to irreversible damage. A lot of it results in brain damage. And so um, the only way to really um, kind of prevent that is by detecting or predicting that the cardiac arrest is about to happen and trying to, to facilitate uh, the transition so it doesn't happen, right? That's the best scenario. But the less a person stays in that state also uh, reduces the, the likelihood of them actually getting the brain damage. So uh, early detection and prevention is what we are targeting. I think machine learning is really good at that and that's what we are trying to do. <clears throat> So the problem um, in, in critical care, uh, I don't know if you've been, it's, it's really fascinating uh, how, how clinicians work in this environment, but um, especially in the kids units, this is this tiny babies and they're like 300 machines around. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard uh, to, to stomach, but um, they have a lot of uh, streaming data. So they have a lot of static data, kind of clinical data. They also have a lot of streaming data. So this kind of monitor, it just keeps streaming and it keeps coming up with data. And the clinician has to kind of keep, or a nurse has to keep out of one, one eye, in addition to doing all these procedures, all the recording of what she's doing, she has to um, record all of this and kind of track all of this information and see an abnormality and react to it, right? It's really hard. Um, so they, they really have to, um, to be fast and on their feet and just in time, right? So I think this is an ideal situation that we have a lot of data and for the algorithms, it's the best thing that we can actually take that data, process it and make, make a prediction. So um, what is it that my lab does? We actually develop machine learning algorithms for solving specific uh, problems like, like this one. Uh, but others as well, diagnosis, prognosis, treatment, 
et cetera. So this is, this is actually real data that we got from Peter Lawson. Peter Lawson is the head of critical care at SickKids. He's also my co-chair of AI and Medicine uh, Initiative, uh, which is a cross-hospital initiative that we are chairing. And uh, this is real data that we processed. We, we had uh, uh, several examples of events of critical, uh, uh, of, of cardiac arrest. And we simply built um, kind of, I don't know how many of you do this on a regular basis, but if you do build deep learning models, kind of a CNN slash LSTM type models, you would have seen this type of graph a lot of times. And if you don't, it doesn't matter because it's just a, a nonlinear predictive model which basically outputs a risk score based on the streaming data. Um, so we built a, a, a model per signal because, and this is a, a tricky situation because real data is dirty. It is never clean, it is never perfect, it is almost always missing in some way that you don't anticipate. And uh, so here you see that we have several signals. We had uh, six signals here, but majority of the signals were missing at the time. But we can take advantage by building kind of per signal model, we can take advantage of the signal when it is present, which, was, uh, which is what we did. And uh, we can predict, uh, actually, um, with this, with this data, we can, with 70% accuracy, I think it's a bit higher now, predict uh, cardiac arrest about five minutes in advance. So five minutes is not a lot of time. It's not a lot of time. And we asked the clinicians, but the clinicians were excited. Why? Because within five minutes, you can actually prepare. You can actually bring the whole, the whole team, and you put the team in place, you put all the equipment in place, and you can Actually, so this, this kind of early detection and stopping to prevent the uh, uh, severe outcomes, this is possible with five minutes. Another thing that's possible with five minutes, which I didn't realize, is that um, clinicians don't have any measures at the hospital for prevention of this type of events right now. There are no kind of uh, metrics for saying you've prevented so many uh, cardiac arrests, but they do prevent cardiac arrests. So using this kind of tools, uh, they can actually start measuring their performance on prevention, which is also very, very important, right? So to see where the help is actually needed. Uh, so this, this is the work of uh, my student, uh, Sana Tony Caboni, and it, it's been, uh, this one was published. And so the way that it works right now, the way that kind of machine learning and healthcare works right now is you get some data, and often we don't necessarily know where that data comes from. You process the data, then you design some ML solutions, and usually you just have fun in designing it, uh, throw whatever the best we can think of, and then you write a paper. And this is it. Kind of nice, right? Um, well, the reality is that there's a huge team behind generating that data that has the knowledge and the capacity to help us understand what the data means. Right? There are so many artifacts in the data which we don't know about, and we can overlook, and, which results in false positives, and in uh, false alarms. And even if we have 1% error in a rare event, this results in thousands of false alarms. Right, And this is non-trivial uh, thing in a critical care where many things are happening. We, they can't really afford having thousands of false alarms. And 1% error is pretty good for machine learning uh, algorithms learned on real data. So this, this, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. So what, what happens in the reality of, of this is that AI and machine learning, um, people say, oh, it'll come and they'll save your company, it'll save your day. But it's a small, it's a small portion in, in, this, uh, in, in a way that we can help to change practice, clinical practice. It is a very small portion. And so we work very, very closely with, uh, uh, with Peter's team who, who have the um, kind of human, um, human factors, uh, people who, who work with uh, clinicians who say, okay, what kind of output do you need to interpret the, the, the model properly, right? What we do is we output numbers, we output very ugly curves and it's all good, right? But, but they, they can't take that data, they can't take an AUC number and do something with it. They really have to have this this kind of nugget of information that will influence their decision. So um, 
this is uh, not only this is happening and this is uh, um, you know a very tricky uh, and a, and a big a long long process it also is an iterative process right so if we so we are, we are kind of in the process of assessing it and retrospectively testing it on all the data over the last 10 years and um, roughly and uh, Putting putting it in practice, right? And then and then we have to go back, not necessarily to the drawing board, but to adjust the algorithm to say, okay, to adjust the human factors component, to adjust the interface with the clinicians, to make sure that it's efficient. So um, we actually did something uh, interesting. So there is a lot of talk about explainability in AI. They say, oh, the models is a black thing and a box and. A, Square and uh, we don't know what this is, why should we trust this system? So first of all, people who say that, they're being disingenuous because clinicians use black boxes all the time. It's their gestalt, right? It's the, the information, the experience that they've had, the, the algorithm that they built internally in their mind to make predictions for, for things, right? They see there's a standard uh, procedure in, in the in a clinic to say, if this is the condition, this is the outcome. But they know that it's outdated. And so sometimes they look at the patient, they see something is wrong here. They can't really explain why it's wrong, but they know something is wrong. They ask for more tests and, and essentially they are working with black boxes. But that's not a reason for not trying to kind of explain why we are making the decisions. And here's why we, we do this is because um, the way that clinicians, what is, what is the information that would be helpful to the clinician to make the decision, right? When they do a blood test, they have an idea that when, uh, I don't know, albumin is elevated, there is some problem maybe with the liver or something, right? But the reality is that when there's a risk of something goes up, they can't really internalize and interpret it. They don't know how to act based on that information. So we have to tie it back to what they know right now, right? Maybe. Maybe as there is more familiarity with these tools, it'll change. But it, right now, we have to give them the information. That's one thing. And the second thing, it actually helps us explaining how our models work, actually helps us to understand what our model does, the errors that it makes, why it makes these errors. It helps us to improve our algorithms. So what we did, and this paper is in submission in the review right now, is the 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 attempt to explain a model like I just presented, right? So what it does is it has the signal, it has a streaming signal, and somewhere it looks like it's different from the rest of the time, right? If you look at it, once it's pointed out, you know that it's different. But with the streaming data, it's a lot harder. So how do we know, how can we tell that something that's going on, it potentially results in a risky uh, outcome, right? <laughs> so the way that we built it, we call uh, this a counterfactual. If you take out this piece. The question is, would the model have predicted the behavior that it's observing, right? So if we build a model that is a good model for the data, and then we make a prediction for the next time step, and it really drastically diverges from the time step, uh, from the actual observation, then something is wrong, right? Either with the data or the, mo or the model, but something is wrong. So this is, this is basically what we did. We built a counterfactual model that is saying, um, if it actually, if the change in the observed data, where we are substituting with a counterfactual data, results in the change in the outcome, then this is an important, important piece, important time point in your time series, right? So this is uh, what we did, and actually, when you see, it is kind of hard to tell. When, when, when you have a, a bunch of signals, right? And this is where it's really important. If, you, if we are predicting, so the blue solid line on the top plot is the risk. And if you stare at it long enough, you can actually see in the bottom line, actually tells you which feature sensed the risk going up or which feature sensed the risk going down. And this is, this is what is very, very helpful to see for the clinician to say, maybe they missed something. Right? If they didn't see the risk is going down, they don't need to make as many measurements. If the risk is going up, they need to make more measurements. And actually what we see here, there are some uh, beige kind of columns, and this is when the measurements were done or a particular procedure were done by the clinician. And so it kind of aligns for some of these uh, peaks that we detected. 
but at least it gives uh, clinicians a chance to not act on a false positive. They say, oh, you said that because of this, but we actually predicted that, and we already did something to correct for that, so we don't need to worry about it, right? As opposed to just seeing risk going up and not, not knowing exactly why this has happened. So the question is, is our work done, right? So we are doing some explainability, we are building models that are kind of predictive, so this is all nice. But we all know that especially deep learning models are not robust, right? So a lot of you have probably seen this, uh, the adversarial attack, I don't know if you're watching the, the adversarial attack literature, but uh, it is actually very, very, very easy to fool uh, deep learning models, especially in imaging, that a lot of those models are just overfitting to the data. So you have a turtle, you add white noise, and you predict a rifle, right? So you change the class, it makes no sense anymore. To the human eye, nothing really changed except a bit of noise. But uh, to the computer, it made a huge change, right? Imagine what this does to a medical prediction uh, tool. So this is, this is very, very important. How do we build robust models? Another, of course, uh, the type of attack is this, uh, um, a few years ago, there was a single point attack. So I don't know if all of you can see, but there is a white point on every one of these pictures. And if that point is adversarially selected and uh, kind of taken out of the picture, replaced with a white uh, background, then the, the ship becomes a car, the horse becomes a frog. One point, one. Um, of course, it's a very poor resolution image, so. Uh, well, that's why one point matters, but then you can take a patch out of a high resolution image and again you have to And especially it's funny when you take a patch out of the background, right? You have an x-ray and you take a patch out of the background and re replace it with white noise and the, the classification changes. And this is happening, this is happening now. The systems are not immune to that. They don't, they just don't report it. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to build robust models in, uh, in care. It's another situation related to bias in the data. So there is already bias in the data. So what happens is that when a patient with asthma presents to the hospital um, and has pneumonia, they're treated much more aggressively, which results in the fact that people with pneumonia have higher rate of survival than uh, people that are otherwise healthy. So what does the algorithm learn? is that pneumonia is actually protective of asthma. So it's good to have, new, uh, sorry, asthma is protective of pneumonia. It's good to have asthma, right? It's a, such a great thing to have asthma um, uh, when, you, when you get pneumonia. So, so this, is, this is in the data. This is not unreasonable that the algorithm learned that. We just have to be aware of the biases and correct for them, right? Um, so there are many mistakes that people make, even we still make without uh, realizing. Um, so sometimes a lot of people are solving the questions that uh, are not really relevant to the, uh, to the clinician. So for example, there was a big uh, physio net challenge where uh, they were trying to predict mortality and um, they didn't remove uh, kind of the comfort measures from the data. And the comfort measures indicate that the clinicians have already decided that this patient is dying and that, that they will die soon. And so nothing is done for this patient except for the, these comfort measures. So basically, when the comfort measure is, is uh, in the data, this already means uh, death uh, effectively. But it was one of the predictive features. So of course you can do 100% accuracy, right? Because this is, the, the clinician has already decided there's no new information in solving a problem like that to the clinician. And what we are trying to do is help to, with the decision making. So not knowing where the model is applicable, very, very common. So um, I don't know, there's a particular demographics that was used to train a model. It was not assessed, and then the model is applied to a, a different population, a different hospital, community uh, hospital somewhere in a, I don't know, in a remote location in, in Quebec, right? And it's learned in, a, in Toronto population. Or even worse, uh, if it's done the opposite way, when it's learned on a very specific population, a remote population, which is much more homogeneous and applied in Toronto. Of course, it will not work. If it works, it's a fluke. It should not happen. So. 
um, this this is very very common. Um, the biases in the data that I've already mentioned, but even like the cross validation, all of us do cross validation, right? But the reality is, depending on what your task is, if you are trying to evaluate something prospectively and you have a trend in your data, and you just split everything randomly, then that trend is not accounted for in your data. There's a way to random split where you will be um, confounding the trend. And so it will not be applicable in the real study. So it's just one of the examples. But there are many, many examples where you have to be thinking about how it will be applied and testing it accordingly. So prospectively, if it's applied prospectively, it has to be tested prospectively. Um, and uh, yeah. So there is a lot more work that needs to be done. We, we, are, we keep thinking about these questions. We keep trying to uh, educate the community about the importance of thinking about these questions. Um, but there is a lot of work ahead. So um, it is very, very important to build effective teams. If any of you are working, it's probably true of any industry, really. But in clinical care, it's really important because there is a wealth of uh, knowledge which is uh, which computer scientists do not have, which really affects how the data is treated, what models are built, what objective functions are defined. And it is very important to do it together with the clinicians. Um, the pipeline for system evaluations, it's a wild west. Everybody does a, something different. Uh, there is no really stable pipeline for evaluating the system, for deciding is it ready for uh, practice, uh, clinical practice. And uh, we are still working on that and uh, deploying effective systems. And now people are saying, well, what happens you know, if the system is iteratively learning? There are no systems that I know currently in practice that are iteratively learning. The best, they are updated every so often. But the, such algorithms do exist, and hopefully they will be implemented uh, in reality soon. And the question is, how should they be regulated? What should we check the safety of these models as they're constantly training, right? So. Uh, this is this is uh, a lot of work that still needs to be done. So there are exciting developments at our hospital, but the hospitals across uh, Toronto and uh, across Canada in general. Um, we are rethinking who should be accessing the data. We are trying to make sure that a lot more people have access to the data so that we can use the wisdom of the crowds to build better models. Um, there are exciting collaborations across disciplines. I have a new postdoc who is a postdoc in AI and ethics and uh, trying to solve the questions and design the solutions with the ethics in mind. Originally, nothing like this was done before in, in uh, machine learning that I know we were never trained in ethics. And having this kind of interdisciplinary information is very, very important. And what's also super exciting to me is that clinicians are starting to do AI. So there are people who are MDs, who are trained MDs, who say, OK, uh, you know, I, I took a bunch of Coursera courses, I can actually do and train this deep learning. And I think this is what's happening. This is what's happening. And I think this, th there's a lot of, so they have the background information and, and there will be more of them. And I think it's incredibly exciting because it means that we'll have a lot more solutions that, uh, that will be available in the clinic. So I work in a lot of different things. I, I gave you an, an example of essentially one, two, uh, applications we work on a lot of things. I have uh, my former student in the audience uh, who's been working on reinforcement learning for deciding which measurements to take in uh, critical care, so which and when, um, uh, translating what clinician want into machine learning, uh, predicting cancer onset from cellular data, generating whole body MRIs using GANs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We do a lot of different types of work uh, in in my lab and as part of the AI and medicine initiative. And with that, I think I said enough. So I'll be happy, I'll hang around, and I'll be happy to answer questions. And I want to thank my amazing lab. Uh, they really are amazing. And uh, they've done all this, this work that I talked about today, and my, my funders and my sponsors at the institution. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Sorry. Okay.
Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Uh, in the first example about the uh, kid that has some, uh, you know, attacks from the uh, from the break, breaking their bone. So uh, since uh, machine learning is based on the training data, so I'm wondering how did you get the training data for this cardiac actually um, attack, so that you can actually predict that something is happening. So our critical care has been amazingly forward thinking and they started collecting. So usually, I don't know if you know, but usually all of this um, kind of uh, displays that are running this, this values, that data is not stored. It just goes away. So they've been storing that data for years now. And within that data, there are many examples of cardiac arrest, including this kid. So cardiac arrest happens for many different uh, reasons, and we are thinking that for some of the individuals, we'll be able to predict much more in advance than for others. For some, it just spikes. You can see in the data that there's probably no way to predict it earlier unless we use different kinds of data. But uh, we, we had, um, I think, about 140 examples of streaming data, but 24 hours and every five seconds sampled. And now we are working with just directly with waveforms are starting to work with. I saw some hands here. There's one here. So in this, thank you for your presentation. So in the slide where you designed uh, the counterfactual signal, how do you measure that if it's a good counterfactual? So, I mean, you, you can look at the, uh, correlation of the signal with uh, what, what you're predicting, right? Because you keep predicting the signal and you can look at the, uh, the correlation of the signal with a, the with a one. It's so there can be many variants. Uh, mm -hmm. There can be many variants of the counterfactual event. Of course. Yeah, that's, that, it really depends. There are many, many ways to model uh, signaling data. So there are many ways uh, to make that prediction. A lot of people are doing kind of wavelet decomposition first and making predictions on the, uh, the different uh, components. There are m many ways to, to generate the signal. The idea is that your signal is good enough on the um, uh, stretches of the data where there are no events. Okay. And that's what you have to monitor. And, and once the system is kind of stable enough that it, it does really well at predicting the signal, where there are no events, then we start predicting further uh, when we don't have data. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. One more? There was a question here. Um, first of all, thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I've worked with the healthcare and, and genome center for that matter, and the information that you could get from from, from these about people specifically on the genome profiles is really, really, you know, like too much. Um, how would you, you know, yeah, like, how do you know that these algorithms or the machine learning data that keep, keeps the privacy of the data on those people? How, how would you design them, to, the anonymity and the privacy of that data? How do you handle that? Is this being recorded? Um, yes. So privacy is a really big, uh, question. I'm not sure I'm going to answer this fully. Um, yeah. If you take the full genome, there's no way to de-identify it. That's the bottom line. Um, uh, there is a lot of, so there, there are FIPA uh, guidelines for de-identifying data, right? Not storing their uh, people's uh, names, ages, uh, exact zip codes. Uh, sometimes you can store up to three, like the, the region, and not storing the address, not storing the... Um, so the privacy is an important point because actually, for example, the location of the, of the person or their history is very predictive of what happens to them afterwards, right? Especially um, when uh, these are outcomes depending on exposure, right? Previous and uh, repetitive exposure. So um, a lot of... Uh, the more we, data we, we get, the more likely we are to find the data that is actually predictive of the outcome that we want. So for the research, uh, for the impro improvement of the quality of care, I think privacy is less of a concern because we are doing it within the hospital. We are not taking the data out at all. 
and we are doing it for quality improvement purposes. How sharing the data more broadly has um, a lot of uh, potential issues, and then it comes to benefits versus risks. Of course, if somebody is malignant, if somebody is malicious, they can most certainly find a way to get the data and to use it um, in, in, in ways that will be detrimental to the society. Okay, one more. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, one of the questions that I had has to do with uh, some of these algorithms that you're working on seem computationally expensive. So how would you expect, say, like a walk-in clinic or something more smaller in scale or maybe even developing countries? How do they plan on, if you were to introduce this sort of idea, especially with like the cardiac arrest case, if they were to go ahead and build these algorithms themselves, would they be using something more shallow in nature or um, what sort of recommendations or opinions do you have there? So this is a great question, right? There was a paper recently in the last couple of months about uh, how, how much electricity it takes to, to train uh, deep learning, some of the deep learning systems and it's a lot. Um, the differences between training a system, so we need a lot of capacity to train uh, these models. We need a lot less for just having them deployed. The point is that we can never actually take uh, the models um, from tra trained in Toronto and use them in uh, populations that are co with completely different profiles, right? They have to be kind of specialized. Even if the model stays the same, it has to be somewhat retrained or augmentatively uh, uh, trained, right? So, um, that's a very good point. Uh, there is um, um, the resources are shared. The resources, the computational resources, there are clouds, right? People use clouds now. So obviously, the um, the clouds are accessible across the world. The question is, what what will it take, and how they will be subsidized? They're becoming cheaper. It's it's a very good point, but uh, and and it's not solved right now. Thank you. Unfortunately, because of the time limit, we have to stop here. But uh, I have a question. If somebody wants to find out more about your amazing work, where can they go? How they can follow you? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really big on Twitter, and I, um, I, I follow people rather than posting. But um, our work uh, uh, has been kind of covered in a lot of uh, media. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there's my lab, and uh, I have a project manager and uh, somebody who has the time to respond to emails. So um, we are always interested in new ideas and, and uh, always happy to talk more about what we do. So um, th there, are, there are ways, and I try to keep my Web page, labs web page up to date. So. Okay, so we'll, we'll add that in uh, our newsletter or on the meetup. So thank you again for the amazing talk. Thank you.